the, the title of this talk is Academic Practitioner Relationships, Developments, Complexity. Okay, I'm, I'm just telling you it's okay to record this. And Opportunities, the, the title comes from a book I co-edited with Jane McKenzie from Henley Business School a couple, a couple of years ago. And I know she is here today for which I'm very grateful. Um, let, let me say at the beginning, just one, um, one thing. At the Academy me Management meeting this summer, I was sort of distressed to see that some people are saying, oh, there are problems with academics and practitioners. And thinking, um, these folks haven't been paying attention for the last 20 years. So I, I, I think that at the end of this talk, if nothing else, you will see that this is a very complex topic. It, we, actually, many of you know that already. So uh, OK, so this is, this is how I'm going to present this. I'm going to give uh, this is this talk is going to include several related but discrete topics. The first one is that true academic practitioner sharing is impossible. Second, academic practitioner collaborative research. Third, some 21st century developments beyond collaborative research. Fourth, a contemporary emphasis on impact, especially in the UK, which you all, this, those of you in the UK certainly know about. The question of academics say, well, gee, we really want to have an impact. Do we have anything to say that's worth somebody hearing? And then conclude with a brief discussion of social scientists confronting global crises. And after each topic, I will have a slide that has pause on it. So you can just stop and think for a few seconds, see if you have any questions you want to ask. And I, I think um, unless you have some immediate questions, it might be easiest if you just wait until after I've completed the talk to, to address, the top, address your questions. However, if you really want to say something during the pause time, just please say it. Okay, let's start out with the with the statement that, of course, academic practitioner sharing is pretty much impossible. There are two things that are going on. One is there's a gap between academics and practitioners. And the other is that academic practitioner relationships are fraught with tensions. I'll address both of these. Okay, so clearly there's a gap between academics and practitioners. Everybody knows that. And it's written about in many places one of one of which is the Harvard Business Review. And we here are two relatively recent articles. And the the first one in 2016, like many business leaders, Donovan Neal May routinely seeks out information on business innovation, innovation and management trends. He reads reports from market analysis firms, white papers for companies in his field, but he rarely bothers with academic business journals. Academic research can be helpful, but it tends to be overly complex, hard to digest, and not backed by real quantitative insights. Okay, so management research is pretty useless for practitioners. And of course, this is a sentiment that has been echoed by some academics. Alfred Kieser, Lars Lehner, particularly in the Journal of Management Studies about 12, 12 years ago, said, Basically, by definition, academic research cannot be relevant to practice because they basically operate in two separate spheres, two separate social systems that are self-referential or auto -poet. I think I won't try to say that word, but means that communication elements of one system, which is science, cannot be authentically integrated into the communication of other systems such as a business organization. So, okay, can't be done by definition. And from more, a more empirical perspective, Dick Daft and Ari Lewin, when they had started the journal Organization Science, they started it in part to, uh, to link academia and practice. And 
They wanted to loosen the straitjacket of footnote on footnote research as a means to open our field to fresh ideas. But as you can see here, they came to the conclusion that this can't be done, that this was an unrealistic aim. And so what organization science should do is public, publish basic research that's a source of knowledge about organizations to diverse academic communities. Okay, that was the first part of this topic. The second part is just a recognition that academic practitioner relationships are fraught with tensions a term that refers to a wide variety of dichotomies, dualities, conflicts, inconsistencies, and contradictory poles that seem to require a choice of one or the other. Here are a few examples, logics. In, in 1981, I think Roger Everett and Merrill Lewis wrote a paper on inquiry from the inside and the outside, which described the different logics underlying inquiry by external researchers who want to learn things related to theory and inside members of an organization who want to know how do I succeed here? Where, where's the right room? What, what, what do I need to do to fit what this person likes and so forth? That's one thing that's different. Another, di di different, another distinction is time dimensions with the usual assumption that Academics timelines are much longer than practitioners. A third is communication practices. As you all know, what we write in our journals is often not what is the most interesting thing in the world to practitioners to read. The by far the topic that gets the most attention is the assumption that academics care about rigor and practitioners care about relevance. And actually, I will say just briefly, I've, based on my own experience, I've come to the conclusion that this is absolute idiocy, but that's, that's for another day to discuss. And finally, that academics and practitioners have different interests and incentives. If I really like a practitioner and I say, oh, the biggest thing I can give you is co-authorship on this article, they may not see it as this is the highlight of my life. Um, I don't know what the interests and incentives are at Cranfield. And actually, given the folks here today at all of the places where you teach. So just pause for one second. So is this a good time to ask questions, Jean? Um, maybe one question, but then let's go on. If somebody has a question, if not. Maybe I could go if that's OK, okay uh, if there isn't anyone. It, it seems to portray a, um, if you don't mind me putting it this way, a rather pessimistic view. Yes, it does. So. Hang on, because we're about to get optimistic. Okay, but you're right. You're absolutely right, and that is off. That has often been the focus of conversation. And there's no way this could happen. So let's start switching. Actually, thank you. That was a great question for transition. So the rest of the this talk is really, yes, there can be collaboration, and I'm going to discuss first collaborative research possibilities. And I'm gonna talk about briefly about four of them, action research, insider, outsider team research, mode two, and engaged scholarship. So action research, I, I, I'm going on the assumption that many of you are familiar with, with the term, if not the actual practice of action research but involves outside researchers collaborating with an or members of an organization over a matter of genuine concern and doing, doing collaborative research in a way that leads to both the problem being solved and some sort of contribution to knowledge. There are not very many examples of this in management journals. Action research is still being used a lot in various other social sciences, but not in management. And I was thinking this morning, as I noticed, I said recent, this is getting less and less recent. 
but it's the most recent that I know of in the Academy of Management Journal where Lusher and Lewis um, used an action research approach. Lusher was an outside consultant and Marianne Lewis was an academic and Lusher consulted with managers at Lego who were involved in a restructuring and that was going to be team-based. And so the, a lot of the managers had no idea, what do I do when there are teams running, running their own work? How do I be a manager? And this is actually an elegant description of many uh, of an action research approach. A second approach is one I helped to develop and it basically it is not meant to solve a problem in the setting, but it's the occasion when academics and practitioners jointly plan, conduct, act on, and publish the results of the research. It, it came from my desire and concern that mostly when we do field research and publish it, it's the academics alone telling the story of what happened in a setting so that the members of the setting often don't have a chance to contribute to what's told about their own setting. And so I developed a way that you can see this book go into much more depth about ways that academics and practitioners can collaborate. Um, incidentally, I, I gave you, Brad, a, a list of about six papers, one that goes one for each of the segments of here. And, and the, uh, the very first paper about insider outsider team research was a paper Merrill Lewis and I published in 1992 that just basically introduces it. It talks about the fact that it's possible for academics and practitioners to build on the tension that comes from the different logics so that they can together create a marginal person who can see much more what's going on in a setting than would be the case either with insiders themselves or outsiders themselves. The third topic is mode two, which as far as I know, in the UK at least, has been a very salient, but I don't know much about it. So, um, so I'm gonna say what I know, and those of you who are actually in the UK can comment at some point. It was introduced by Gibbons et al. In, a, in 1994 in a book for the natural sciences. And it basically means transdisciplinary work in which academics across different disciplines and academics and practitioners together work to understand what's going on in some particular phenomenon and to contribute to dealing with it. And in fact, Ken Starkey and Madad advocated that we should restructure academic institutions to, en to enable mode two approaches, especially in the social and organizational sciences. So in other words, we need to restructure academic institutions so that it's much easier for people in different academic fields to collaborate with each other and, and it's easy for folks in different academic fields and practitioners to collaborate. This is my sense of what has happened in mode two because this all arose in the UK. I think that every once in a while in management, this approach has been used successfully empirically. But Swan et al found that even in the physical sciences, what started out as a collaborative endeavor drifted into standard mode one research that was not collaborative over time. I believe that there has been a huge, there's a very large number of practitioner doctoral programs in the UK. And from what I've heard, mode two has, mode two has been emphasized in those programs, but I don't know if I'm right about this. And I realize that many of you cannot answer the question, but those of the UK maybe can. And I just wanna mention that while the term hasn't been used, actually Boston College where I work is developing a new integrated science center that's totally consistent with mode two, but its founder never heard of mode two. So clearly 
um, there's a there's something in the air about this, although it doesn't always go on under this name. So this is the Schiller Institute for Integrated Science and Society. And what they're trying to do is create cross-disciplinary research and collaboration. Just so you can see, this was last Friday. This was as the building is going up right outside my office. So uh, if you hear weird sounds, it will be construction. Um, but one of the things that struck me when I looked at the, the initial grants they've given, they're all cross-disciplinary, but there's only one person from the School of Management involved in any of them. And that's a guy who runs a real estate center. So clearly academics and management are not collaborating with people in the rest of the university. Okay, then another one is engaged scholarship that to my mind at least, although Boyer talked about something sort of related to this several years ago, Andy Vandeven was very instrumental. It was, was primary person to develop, but we already talked about, yes, research partners, partnerships are more meaningful when academics and practitioners collaborate jointly. They formulate a big problem, they develop alternative theories, collect evidence to examine them and apply findings to address the problem or question. And his notion was that engaged research includes all these different sections there's a section on research design, there's a section on problem solving, a section on theory building and theory. And that what uh, th that there are some parts of these that academics will be more involved in and some parts of these that practitioners will be more involved in. But the idea is that there is a connection across them all. And there actually is an example of a study that used this model in, um, by Brunette et al. that used, used an Andy's engaged scholarship approach to a normative assessment of projects in a public organization in Quebec. The authors conducted a normative assessment of the public organization managing major projects. Initially, practitioners were skeptical about a group of researchers intruding on their practices and projects. However, the uh, what happened over time was the practitioners started to develop some competence in the team of researchers. And researchers started to develop some, comp some confidence in the practitioners. So what, what they said was from a preconceived idea of organizational reality at the start of the project, we came to develop the humility needed to better understand organizational dynamics. Incidentally, at some point, Brad is going to send you a whole bunch of readings Pardon, now he's going to send the readings. He's going to send a, a list of readings, and everything. It, this study will be included, just so you have have access to all the materials I'm talking about. The term engaged scholarship has been expanded a lot recently, beyond what Andy talked about. So, uh, beyond what Andy Vandeman talked about. So, Andy Hoffman, for example has re recently published a book on, on the engaged scholar and the need for the emergence of a more publicly and politically engaged scholar. Um, and his own work has reflected engaged scholarship. And there's also an Academy of Community Engagement, at least in the US. I don't know enough about the UK to talk there but the assumption again is that there are increasing external pressures from various funding agencies that have that have required faculty to be involved much more as a partner with various practitioners in the search for answers to our most pressing problems. So I just want to comment on about notice what's emphasized here. In this, in this segment of the talk. Joint problem definition based at least partly on practice-based concerns. Diverse teams conducting research and dissemination of findings to both academics and practitioners. 
So this is a chance for a pause. I think the only question I would have here is, is it true that a lot of um, practitioner-based doctoral programs in the UK or someplace around that use um, use mode two and talk about it? If, if any of you know the answer and want to say it quickly, or you can save it for later. Um, Jim, from what I know, um... I think there are, there are people who are better placed to answer this question because they're running, the, the, they supervise students on these programs. But um, I'm aware that, for example, some universities offer a doctor of management or doctor of professions, I think it's called, yeah. which is a base, they use action research uh, as, a, as, a, as a methodology. Um, yeah. Okay. okay uh, there's great. a question in the chat, Jane. Okay, I can't see the chat right now. Yeah, so. I'll read it out to you. Okay. Uh, the, the question is, Stephen is asking, how can we as researchers in our, our ivory towers start researching the field with the methods Jean just described, i.e. other strategies to establish contact and propose collaboration, or does it depend on your network where you get offered an opportunity? Uh, that uh, That is a great question that I think requires more than a quick answer. So could you hold that for later? Because I think that's really important and I don't, I don't want it to be lost, but it, it can't be addressed entirely here. Okay, so Stephen, thank you for the question. And let's come back to it. I think some of the next topics will be related, I think. Um, so these are some, the third topic is some recent developments beyond research. Um, or at least beyond collaborative research. So there's a growing range of topics addressed in writing about academic practitioner links. There's evidence-based management and an emphasis on relationships beyond research. So growing range of topics addressed in writing about academic practitioner links. Um, Sarah Rhines and I did, a, did an analysis for a chapter in the, the book that Jane McKenzie and I co-edited where we looked at what's being written about regards to academic practitioners. And we saw there were all kinds of conflicting messages. One is that contact between academics and practitioners is good because the academics will get more citations and the practitioners will be able to do more. Uh, yeah, but maybe, but there are all kinds of differences and differences in values between academics and practitioners, especially in human resources. And, Actually, there are basic differences in the culture of academia and practice. Um, and oh, incidentally, practitioner journals impact academia more than academic journals affect practice. And then finally, that academics and practitioners often have similar addresses and concerns. So I'm just saying that this is not an area where there's agreement. I also want to talk just briefly recognize evidence-based management which is derived from evidence-based medicine. It came about in, uh, in part because of, um, uh, well, it came about after World War II. I could say much more about that. And then social science. The, early, the earliest paper that described it for management was a paper that David Cranfield and David Denier, who teaches it at Cranfield, and Palminder Smart wrote in the 2003, followed by a, a, paper, a presidential address to the Academy of Management and then publication by Denise Rousseau in 2006. And the, the paper that David Tranfield and his colleagues wrote was based on the fact that the UK was already operating out of evidence-based approaches in some governmental areas. And in management, it has arisen in part out of the awareness that managers often make decisions based on faddish rationales when scholarly evidence can guide them. Um, so it includes multiple attempts to help managers and other practitioners learn how to use scholarly evidence. And, the, um, and it is also fostered an emphasis on systematic reviews. I don't know if David Denier is here right now, and I can't check, but he and I are involved in, a, in another project having to do with systematic reviews. 
and we're aware that a lot of the a lot of what has been written about systematic reviews arises out of evidence-based management and other kinds of evidence-based practice. So here is this example of the Center for Evidence-Based Management, which is physically located in the Netherlands uh, with Eric Berens and Denise Rousseau writing about it and talking about what evidence-based practice in management is, is making decisions based on the best available evidence from multiple sources. This again is a topic that could go on forever. And another topic here is relationships beyond research that is important that uh, I wrote about in 2007 is, what does it mean for academics and practitioners to have mutual relationships with each other? What does it mean to actually get to know each other, to be genuinely interested in others' experiences, being trustworthy and seeking feedback from each other? And that, that is an important dimension in any kind of academic practitioner relationship. Another thing that George Rahm and his several colleagues in, the, in Europe have written about in particular is trading zones which, uh, between academics and practitioners, which I think is a really important development. So this is not saying that, gee, oh, uh, academics and practitioners all ought to be friends. No, it's not saying that. It's say, it focuses on how communities with disparate meanings and logics can collaborate despite their differences. How trading zones can help actors to address often overlooked yet deep-seated problems related to knowledge integration. So I think that this, this notion of trading zones is, is really important because it talks about what academics and practitioners each can bring to a particular situation. And you don't have to be best friends with each other to do that. Okay, brief pause. Hello, Jean. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Hi, um, I'm Esther Sylvester. Uh, it's a great talk. My, my question um, was that you talk about practitioners and scholars as two separate groups, um, but I wondered if you had any thoughts on academics who've also been practitioners and vice versa, because I'm just wondering if this is also about our development and experience. Um, and I suppose I have a personal interest in that because I have a, a little bit of both. <laughs> oh, I, I think there's no question that there, are, that there are a lot of people who embody both. And I, I just, just tell you the way the screen is set up, I can't see you at all. Uh, but yes, there are many people. Uh, Laura Epson has written eloquently about what it is to be both and the challenges of both, being both and to be somewhat marginalized in both areas, but having a lot to bring to it. So that, that's actually a very important issue. So thank you for raising it. Thank you. Okay, let me switch gears a little, talk about what I see is a contemporary emphasis on impact. And I mean impact with, I should have written that at about four times as large as I did, but those of you in the UK are probably aware of the ref. So I, I do need to ask a question in the middle of this. It's supposed to be going on in 2021. Is it going on or with COVID happening, has it been delayed? Does anybody know? It's going on. It's just been delayed, but it's, it's happening now. Oh, lucky you. I'm so envious. That was, say, that was said ironically. I have to admit I'm not envious, but I'm assuming that many of you have some familiarity with this, but I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little about it because I think from the list of countries you mentioned, some of you don't, but it's part of um, every seven years assessment done to basically create rankings of, I think this is right, of every UK 
university and every department in every UK university, and then to publish these online so anybody in the world can get access to, gee, how is the dance department at Reading doing? Okay, so that, so that would be the first topic. Second is translating scholarly research for practitioners. And third is some um, in, initiatives by the, in the, uh, by BAM. So just briefly, because you all know this much, many of you, I shouldn't say that, many of you know this much more than I do, that the research effectiveness framework is, it measures the quality of outputs of research and it also, one of the things it also assesses is their impact beyond academia and an environment that supports research that often has to do with, are there enough resources? But impact is defined as the effect on or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services beyond academia. So as you in the UK know, you have to demonstrate that your work, your scholarly work has an effect, has an impact on society that's to its benefit. And that that is worth 25% of each department's rating. Um, one of the things this has had an impact, impact, yeah, I guess meant as a pun on is it is fostered immense, intense interest within, but far beyond the UK in translating scholarly research for practitioners. So I'm just going to give you a few of many examples that involve translating scholarly research for practitioners, some organizations and communities, some online platforms, a couple business school magazines, and a backwards look. But I I want to mention also that it seems to me from my perspective that many of these focus on one-way communication as opposed to relationships, any kind of joint relationships. So just a, a few examples. There's an impact scholar community that was started by one of the divisions of the Academy of Management. And the, the, what, they, what this is, is a permanent community to support junior scholars in connecting research to impact. So there are founding members, they've had several events that just tell junior scholars and some others, this is how you could have an impact on practice. There's a behavioral policy Science and Policy Association that Sim Sitkin in the US is deeply involved in, which is, as you can see, a global community of public and private sector decision makers, researchers, policy analysts, and practitioners um, that are trying to promote the application of rigorous behavioral science to serve the public interest. And they have a they have a, a number of components. One is they have a uh, an annual conference each week they have they put out um, as a kind of social media some I think it's called behavioral science with short snippets of things and they, they also have a, a journal called behavioral science and policy that is a peer-reviewed journal featuring short accessible articles describing actionable policy applications of behavioral science research and uh, I have involved in, I, I wrote a, I've been involved with one of our doctoral students writing an article for that. And it is getting the most careful copy editing that I've ever seen in my life by somebody who's really, really skilled at figuring out how do you translate stuff so regular human beings can understand what's being said. There's another one that I think that many of you are uh, aware of that it goes far beyond business, but it's been going on for quite a while, that it's a nonprofit independent news organizations dedicated to unlocking the knowledge of experts for the public good. So they publish trustworthy, informative articles written by our academic experts. And this is, you can't see this because it's too small, but they have 
several different sections. And this was the what was in the business and economy section uh, yesterday. It, it, well, this is the UK version. They have different versions for several different uh, several different countries. Um, there's a Strategy Scholars Network that I think is mostly in the US, but it's an organization of university-based scholars committed to using research to improve policy and strengthen democracy. So that's, that's just another one. And there, there are more than this, but I didn't want to talk about every single one. You can get the point. And I'm sure you all know of more than I do. There are so also some online platforms. One is uh, Impact Science, which uh, I, I I appreciate what they what they what they say here is they're trying to repurpose and market traditionally published scientific content to both niche and lay audiences. And these are mostly journalists. I uh, my own sense is that. A lot of people who are journalists who have lost their jobs working for newspapers uh, now are translating academia for practice. There's an entrepreneur and innovation exchange. It's a, a social media platform whose goal is to dramatically improve the success rate of new business ventures and anybody can access it. There's AOM Insights, which brings the best academic research findings to managers and business leaders worldwide. That takes a lot of articles published in journals published by the Academy of Management and translates them into something actionable. And this particular, um, this particular picture is that they, they pulled together um, some articles that focus on voyeurism and they thought that this picture would convey it pretty well. And I, I think they're right. Then there are business school magazines. The one that is by far, uh, at least I think the most ambitious um, is Knowledge at Wharton, which includes um, not only English publications, but also Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, Indian, Arabic, and high school editions has more than 3 million users worldwide. That is articles, that it's all material published by Wharton faculty. And I saw that there's somebody from Warwick here and I, I'm on the mailing list for Warwick Core Insights, which publishes materials uh, that comes from, from Warwick and it, you know, the, there may be other business schools in the UK which do this or wherever you are that do that, that I'm just not familiar with. But these are just two examples of universities taking, um, having, making their faculties work much more salient by having their own online magazines. So there was a special issue of the British Journal of Management that was on impact a few years ago. Um, that Robert McIntosh was the primary editor for, that David Denier and I were both involved in. And one of the things I just want to say is that what we found in talking about impact was that all the papers that were published in that special issue dealt with relationships between academics and practitioners. None of it was just one way, hey, I'm gonna tell you the way to do something. Um, so that one of the focus in all of them was how do we dialogue with each other? What is praxis defined as the pursuit of knowledge infused practice and critical self questioning as a form of reflexivity? And finally, some, some of you in the UK at least have probably seen the new or seen ads for the new management impact series, which comes about, I'm sure, because of, um, because of our uh, the ref process. Uh, Carrie Cooper got me involved in becoming one of the editors of that series. Um, the first book in the series, though there are more on the way, is 
is delivery impact and management research. When does it really happen that, that, that oh, this, sorry, this is no longer forthcoming. I pulled this out. It was published in, it was published in May. But I, uh, and it, a lot of it is saying impact cannot be just, gee, I tell you this thing. It's got to be relational. And one of the things I would also say is any of you who are listening, who are interested in writing about impact for the series, please do. Please do. I would be glad to tell you more about what's involved in submitting a proposal and so forth. Then just a quick backwards look. Kurt Lewin's maxim was there's nothing so practical as a good theory. But, and, and one of the questions we often ask is, oh, gee, how can we have an impact on practice? But what, you know, that's stupid to only go in that direction. That it, there are many works for practitioners that have affected academic scholarship considerably. And I've given a couple examples here, Peters and Waterman's In Search of Excellence and Peter Senge's The Fifth Discipline. So Rob Ployhard and I wrote a, wrote a brief essay for uh, an editor's essay for AMR saying, you know what, maybe we can turn Lewin back to work. There, nothing so theoretical as good practice. Jim, could you elaborate on that? Last statement, there's nothing so theoretical as a good practice. Yes. Um, I, I, I can do it very briefly, but I will say Peter Segge's fifth discipline inspired a ton of research on systems thinking and the other dimensions that he included in that book. And it also had a huge impact on academics focusing on what is a learning organization and moving that in a totally different way of thinking about learning than the original March and Simon and uh, a couple other people, uh, Syrett framework, which focused primarily on learning is where you learn routines and you learn superstitious uh, knowledge and you make all kinds of weird inferences. This this was a, a totally radically different approach to learning that had to do with capabilities. So that's that's one example that has been it's been cited a lot, and I I could go into more detail, but uh, but that's enough for now. So the next thing is okay. We complain all the time. Gee, nobody's listening to us, but. Do we have anything to say that's worth practitioners hearing? So, Samantha Gushal wrote that bad management theories are destroying good management practices. Harley and Fleming said, we're not even trying to change the world. Why do elite management journals ignore the major problems facing humanity? Christopher Wicker and his colleagues well, management in the in JMS in a very recent issue of JMS talk about management research that makes a difference and broadening the meaning of impact. So just briefly, the messages in these papers are, Samantha Gushal wrote, I suggest that by propagating ideologically inspired amoral theories, business schools have actively freed their students from any sense of moral responsibility. Uh, Okay, so we're, we're making our students totally amoral. Great. Uh, Hartley and Fleming said, there's been a lot of discussion of grand challenges, which are global problems that could plausibly address their coordinated and collaborative effort. But Harley and Fleming did an analysis of articles published in top tier journals from 2008 to 2018, if I recall correctly, and found that only 2%, 2.8% of the articles published in these journals addressed any kind of global grant challenge. And uh, 
and they commented, it seems clear that many of us entered academia with the desire to make a positive impact to our work, but very little, is very little published in the top journals enables that to happen. And then Wicker and his colleagues in, in uh, JMS, as I mentioned, is the world is undergoing dramatic transformations and they, they need our research, but management scholars struggle to produce concrete solutions. So in their editorial, they basically say, we want to help scholars seeking to make a difference by broadening our understanding of what is impactful. And there are five forms of impact, scholarly, practical, societal, policy, and educational. And I will give just one example that I think is worth emulating that Sue Mormon wrote a chapter for the book that Jane McKenzie and I edited um, entitled Partnering to Advance Sustainable Effectiveness. Um, th it's a really interesting chapter, just very briefly. It's a research program that had its genesis in the burgeoning concern about finding new approaches to address complex sustainability problems that threaten humanity at academia, commercial, and civil organizations, individuals throughout the world have played major roles. And this is a challenge that is shared by everybody. So uh, th this is a research program that involved finding new approaches to address these issues. It was initiated by researchers in four universities in three countries, two in the US, one in Italy and one, one in Sweden, along with multiple work organizations in each country. They have several topic-based conferences in which they, the, the participants, the academics and the participants share their learnings about the work they are doing to address sustainability problems. And then dissemination is built into the framework. So each conference leads to the production of a volume in the Organization for Sustainability series. There's a question in the chat, which I can read out, Jean. Okay. Um, Bobby is asking, are impactful research projects usually long-term ones, given the need to engage with practice and go through the process? At what point in our career can we afford to do such research? Um, um, that, that, that's a simple question. Um, it, and it's... I, when I say simple, I mean that completely ironically. I think uh, I think the the assumption that it is that it takes a long time to get going. I think um, I I think there are ways of doing something impactful that doesn't take ten years to do. Uh, I I would say that. So um, to, to make some inferential leaps here, um, uh, I think there are ways of fostering new ways of thinking that can be impactful. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, just could, could we come back to this question later at the end? Because th this is a really important question. It's a really important quandary for a lot of people, but I've got one section to go. So let me just do this quickly. Um, so this is Ed Schein's rant. Um, he's a world-renowned organizational behavior professor and consultant who taught at MIT. He, he's now in his 90s and he's living in a retirement home in Palo Alto, California. Um, and 
in April 2020, shortly after the U.S., we got all shut down for, due to COVID. He sent me what he called a rant about a call to action for academics. And I think we can think of it as addressed to all of us. And I'm putting this all in bold because this is the way he wrote it, saying social scientists need to speak up. The next pandemic will be global warming and so forth. We're already seeing, seeing early symptoms of this. And I mean, clearly in the last year, we've seen many more symptoms of it. Um, Ger Germany is particularly... Um, particularly an example with what happened in Cologne and so forth, but also the Western U.S., the hurricanes in several different countries. So this is say social scientists need to speak up. And will we recognize that we need to use methods of collaboration on a global level? And what his focus is, I realize more and more, is that social scientists can deal with is how do we work with each other? even if we can't stand each other, which is one of the reasons trading zones is important to me. So he's saying, can we now put forth what we know and what we believe in to escalate collaboration as a central value? And if we don't speak up now, which is the opposite side of the question that was just asked, is when can we afford not to speak up? Will it be too late when the global warming virus becomes the next global pandemic. So what evolved from that rant was actually a book I ended up editing that is going to be published. It's going to be available in, in November that includes several things, a, attention to relationships across groups and organizations, attention to societal. Oh, pardon me. I should have been clear about what the title was that uh, the title is Social Scientists Confronting Global Crises. And I know Ann Sui is here. She's one of the people who, thank you, Ann, wrote an endorsement for the book. Um, it, it includes relationships across groups, organizations, societal systems, and development over time and what helps accomplish it. And one of the things, one of the questions earlier was what if you're partly in academic and partly you're, you're in practice. And th these are all the authors. I realize this, this is a North American book. So um, it probably would be different if it were coming out of the UK or someplace in Europe or wh wherever any, or India or Israel or wherever any of you are. But this was my attempt to place the authors that some of them uh, attempt with, with the limitations of tabs in Microsoft Word to place the authors that so I very consciously included people whose emphasis is primarily consulting and whose emphasis is primarily academic and some people in the middle. Um, the one chapter I was absolutely convinced had to be in the book was the one by Colleen Magner and Adam Kahan. Adam Kahan has written before about uh, how do you collaborate with people you can't stand? And I think that's one of the central issues in here, but there, it is a combination of academics and practitioners basically working together. I told each of them that the only requirement would, besides the fact that the chapters had to be short was that the chapters had to include something explicit about academic social science scholarship and something that makes the scholarship doable in practice. And I believe that they have done that. And so what this book is, is academics and practitioners working together to address societal concerns. These folks are all engaged scholars in some way. So I'm going to pause now, and then I will. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, well, I'll say, you know, your thoughts, and I'm going to stop sharing now for anybody to raise questions, comments, reflections, anything you think hasn't been addressed enough. Um, come back to some of the issues that we raised before. Oh, who, who's the say say again? Who was the person who raised the question just before about when in, in our 
uh, careers can we afford to to do I think something? Bavia, I think. Okay. Do you want to say Why more? Would you like to ask your question? Yeah. <laughs> Julie just said, can I provide the book title again? Yes, the book title is Social Scientists Confronting Global Crises. And it's going to be published by um, Rutledge. Um, if Barbara is not speaking, maybe I could read out her question again, Jean. Okay, okay. yeah, sure. Oh, no, she. I think she, she's uh, raised her hand. Um, oh, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Ibrat. Uh, thanks, Jean, for the very uh, insightful and very interesting presentation. Yeah, so my question was, I uh, like you rightly said, I had this assumption that uh, conducting uh, in, uh, impactful research, responsible research, or engaged research, all of this would involve a, a bit of uh, pre-processing in the sense to be able to find the right practitioner setting that we want to work with and to take practitioners into a confidence that yes, we want to work with you and understand what you're doing. So I guess there is a bit of learning which I need to have before I can kick off on such projects. And uh, therefore my assumption was this pre-processing and learning along with then uh, accommodating the multiple perspectives which come up uh, both from academic researchers as well as from the practitioners and building that consensus uh, uh, and sorting out the differences and things like that. So I was kind of imagining- Wait, wait, I'm, 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 not, I'm not hearing the last part. Could you say the last part again? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I was kind of imagining that it needs to be a bit of uh, pre-learning which I have to do uh, before I kind of start off on the projects with practitioners, as well as uh, sort out the differences of opinions which uh, which occur between the academic researchers and practitioners in the process. So therefore, I was assuming it's a long process. Uh, so could you probably suggest that how do we start off on carry, ca carrying out such impactful research projects? Um. I think that's that is a really that is a really important question, and um, I I'm gonna uh, and especially if the focus is on collaborative research, I think it does take longer. It does take longer to build up confidence in each other, to build up trust, to uh, to raise questions that fit both both academic and practitioner needs. There's no question of that. Um, I, I'm also going to toss out something which is very, uh, pardon me, so, so part of your, your, the answer to the question goes back to what are the incentives and interests in your university? And if the incentives in your university don't have anything to do whatsoever with having an impact on the world, then it's really hard to do it. Unless you're, you know, like you're, you're, you're old. I mean, you're as promoted as you're gonna get and you can do what you want. But I think it, it, is, it is really a challenge to do it if, there, if your university doesn't have incentives for it and you are in a vulnerable position, like you don't have tenure. But I'm gonna toss up something different too, which is one of the things that I have learned from collaborating with practitioners, that I think that often one of the things that is most helpful in practice is theoretical constructs that do not necessarily come from any practice-based place at all. Like, um, I'll give an example. When I was um, when I was involved in one research, collaborative research study with people who ran the Society for Organizational Learning, they did not know, they were not familiar with some standard notions like first mover advantage. Or other people have never thought of notions like, um, like, cognitive dissonance before, or some of the notions that 
um, Thaler and um, folks who, who I'm blocking on at the moment, names I'm blocking on, but they're very famous, have written about not quite rationality. And my experience literally working with the folks has been that what has been really helpful for them to learn is theories that make sense of their experience. So I actually think that sometimes, I know, notice Don Lang is here, sometimes articles published in a, a journal that is very theoretical can be extremely helpful to practice when there is some sort of translation because it helps to make sense of people's experience. So I guess I'm, that's a kind of long-winded complex answer, but it, it is a very complex and important question. So thank you for raising it. Thank you. Hey. Anup, would you like to go next? Yes, indeed. Thanks, Ibrat. Uh, thanks, Jean, for the fantastic talk. Uh, good to see you. Uh, you know, after after we met in Glasgow all those years back. Uh, it's been a while. Sure, not sure you remember that, though. You know, uh, I, I remember Glasgow. Glasgow. I would. I would give anything to be able to be there in person. But as I said, there is not there. So, but I want to <laughs> go someplace. Someplace. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so, uh, a quick observation, and uh, also my question. Uh, what's happened in the UK increasingly is that you find that universities now almost have this sort of uh, dual uh, uh, career track where you have professors and you have professors of practice uh, with the distinction being that, you know, the actual professor has nothing re relevant or important to say to practice, you know, they're only good at writing academic papers that are read by other academics, you know, so completely self-referential work out of touch with uh, the practitioner reality. Uh, so given this state where universities are not actually steering their academics towards engaging with practice and developing content that's relevant ostensibly to their target base, you know, the, the, the education base that they serve, uh, i.e. the MBA students and the uh, executive education uh, executives and so on and so forth. Uh, What's the what's the way out of this? You know. Well, I'm thinking that it's really lucky that my you you can't see my actual office, which is a mess. But it's really lucky that my door is closed because that is not an issue just in the UK. I can assure you that um, I I think um, I I think that. I, I think it's a complication, but I think one of the um, um, one of the tricks is figuring out how to make stuff that we write for each other pertinent to, to practice too. Uh, but it it's it is really complex. I I asked my dean to be one of the endorsers of our book just so he would know what I was doing, because. This is not the sort of stuff he would necessarily, no, this is not the sort of stuff he would get that excited about. And so when I think when, issue, when universities have incentive systems that absolutely don't incentivize or encourage doing something that matters in the bigger world, then it's, it's much more difficult. And I, I agree with you, we have professors in the practice too. And, and at least here, they're mostly, they teach a lot. But and they're supposed to publish some, not that much. But it's it it almost is like a two-headed monster, not the kind that's um, not the kind that's Janet Janusia that they're both coming in together. It's more going outward. So good point. And the other question I wanted to quickly ask you is, you illustrated uh, various modes of engagement with practitioners. You know, you, you gave us a brief overview of the different modes. Right. Uh, could, you, could you suggest some of the sort of advantages and disadvantages of each mode and when some modes might be more relevant as opposed to the other modes? I, 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 uh, I, I would not... I'd rather ha have them all be part of what somebody could use depending on the circumstances. I definitely think for junior scholars, it's not a bad idea to join the impact scholar community. 
I have to see what those folks are doing. Absolutely. I think that could be worthwhile. That's that something like that, reading some things like the conversation or uh, BSP, behavioral science and policy, that's not a bad idea too. But that's the um, major thing that I would suggest is the, the do, do the simple thing first. Okay, and then uh, that, that's, yeah, it can't hurt to be in a situation where you're trying to make an impact even if it's only a one-way impact, at least you're paying attention to what matters to practitioners who would be reading your work. As I mentioned, I've gotten a huge education from the copy editor of Behavioral Science and Policy. I think her name is Daisy Yuha. So here's a brief shout out to Daisy. If I had something to drink, I would toast her. But I... <laughs> Thank here's, you. A, here's an empty coffee cup. <laughs> Thank you, Anu. Uh, Marish, would you like to go next? Thank you, Ibra. Thank you, Jean. Um, so uh, first, first year PhD going into second year um, and following the passion and paying attention to the conversation around responsible, engaged, impactful research. Um, and developing my identity. Um, and following these conversations, the one big elephant in the room for, for me that's, that I notice seems to be missing is um, the topic of, of teaching. And I'm um, preparing myself very much to, to be a, 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 re a researcher, and I appreciate both, um, both research and, and teaching, though, of course. But with, um, with teaching in the classroom, that seems to me, that's where the, the relationship starts, right? With, uh, with the practitioner and the researcher. That's, that's the first introduction of the relationship. And looking back on my, my own experience, um, the only real introduction to, to research in the social sciences was a literature review. And, um, and I, I wonder, there seems to be an opportunity to um, engage more with uh, undergraduate students in field research, many collaborative um, experiential learning field research with, with students so that when they do become practitioners, they have perhaps a better uh, appreciation for research and, and what it can bring to the, the, the table for them and, um, and uh, you know, the, uh, to draw back on the relationship. Um, when I was in um, management, academia was the past, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, by and the I, past, you mean, on, it, you mean it's what it was your past or? Yes. And, and, and now obviously it's my present, but um, but thinking of myself, you know, as um, as a as a manager, um, ac academia, you know, was um, was a past concept. It's not, you know, um, where you drew from. And I, um, yeah. and right. even though I, you know, I had an MBA. So any, anyway, I would just, I wonder if the teaching relationship can be a part of this um, conversation with I, relationship I, and engagement. I think it's, um, yeah, the Wickert et al. editorial uh, and general management studies emphasize teaching. I think teaching is the most impactful thing that anybody can do. And and it, it's, I mean, with all the stuff Sumatra Goshal wrote that if we actually teach our theories, we're screwing people up and making them immoral. I, I don't think it's, I, I, I don't think it happens that much. I mean, you teachers have some say over how, how immoral they want to make their students. Um, but I, I think that teaching is a, and, and engaging with the students, how respectfully you treat, treat them, how how much alive you make the findings from academia. I, I think that that is, that is a hugely important topic. So I congratulate you on thinking in these terms and um, thinking that you want to do it and for making, so making for your students that, that their academic experience won't be entirely in the past as soon as they can get out of there. So thank you. Thank you, Marishka. Um, 
Jesse, would you like to go next? Sure. So I guess my question is more like practical administrative and maybe not just for Jean, but for anybody who might have experience in this. I work in the Dean's office here at the University of Pittsburgh and impact was measured simply by citation counts. Um, so I was wondering how other schools might define impact and measure practically and how that could look in like, cause I'm interested in eventually going into administration. Um, so that's kind of where my brain goes. Well, somebody else can answer that more, but my sense was the UK government has done more to say impact as far as citation counts than anybody else. And they've, they have had a, 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 a impact that goes beyond the UK, but somebody else can answer that better from your own experiences. Um, Jean, could I jump in here? Yeah, uh, that, that is a question. I, I just like to offer some updates on, on that very important question. How do we actually measure impact on practice and policy in society? Um, there, are not, there are many initiatives going on right now. One of the biggest ones that some of you may or may not know is Financial Times. As we all know, they have a journalist and, and that journalist does not really um, represent anything as, as we know, except number of papers publishing those in them. So the editor for that, for that session, for that particular ranking is working closely with RBM to uh, identify ways that we can measure impact uh, societally. And, and that's going to be something called hackathon, going to be conducted in the near future, collecting ideas from the larger community about how uh, idea, collect ideas on how to measure impact in a variety of ways. And that information potentially can impact uh, some revisions in a journalist and possibly create different kinds of journalists to be more inclusive of what we want our research to do, um, not only for ourselves, but for society as a whole. So that's a very imp important initiative. Uh, it's kind of behind the scene because it's in a planning stage, but, but hopefully in a, uh, shortly you'll be uh, hearing from it, calling for your contribution to that particular project. So I hope that gives and, you some, and, some hope. <laughs> no, that's great. And, and I think I'm going to remember Jesse when something comes up that offers the possibility of that. You'll be my go-to person. Okay. Okay, Jesse. But I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but I think that somebody in a dean's office who's consciously, in, in a country outside the UK, who's consciously thinking, in terms like this, it, it's, it really matters. But I think it's not going to be that easy to, to, break the, to break the current norm. But nevertheless, it's important to have somebody thinking in those terms. So thank you. Well, Jen, I have a different thought on that, if I may, just to finish up my thought here. Sure. I think many deans and social deans uh, wants to have impact on society in terms of research. They just don't know how to measure that. Uh, citations are the most seemingly objective count that you can argue about that. If somehow we can come up with some alternative metric that really is meaningful, that cannot be gamed, I think I really believe that schools will embody that. This, we, everybody's waiting for what can we do to change the way we're doing things, which is not ideal by most yeah. people's uh, awareness. So I'm going to finish it. Thank no, you. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good point. It, I mean, but the alt metrics has existed for quite a while. It, uh, but the, the, the thing that became the web of science started existing in the 1950s. So these things don't happen um, overnight, but that's a, so it's, it's not for somebody who's a junior professor to undertake trying to change a junior scholar. Yeah. Thank you, Jess. And thank you, Anne, for your comments. Um, Helena, would you like to go next? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, fantastic. So I would like to thank you also for your lovely, lovely, uh, talk. It was really important to me. Um, 
I would like to add something that I, I, I think can, cannot be forgotten in this discussion. Um, yes, I, I know that all of these, we need to be very strategic about our careers and that it's very hard to be, being an academic in today's world much more than it was 30, 40 years ago, at least in Portugal where I live. Um, but the thing is, or, and what I've been finding in my own journey as an academic is that impactful research with all its risks, it's also really, really motivating. And something that we all struggle with is how boring <laughs> this work sometimes can be and how, how strenuous it can be to read the text 10 times before you need to send it again. So I think that one of the great virtues of being an engaged scholar and of working with practitioners is that it really increases your intrinsic motivation. So even if, because when you're strategic, you can have a bad strategy and it can not work so well and you'll just be miserable and unsuccessful. <laughs> or you can be miserable and successful. I don't know. Why. Either way. So yeah, I think that one of the really important things about being an engaged scholar in doing impactful work is at least you are feeling better with yourself and you are really motivated. So thank you also for bringing this topic to more to light than it needs to be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that comment, Alma. Uh, and I, I will say also the, the initiative that Aunt, Aunt Sui is taking as it, it, it started and others are with her taking it is, is trying trying their best to get somebody to notice that this actually matters. You know, um, I, I think, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just stop with there. But it, it and as you're saying, if it at least matters to you and you don't lose your job because of it, <laughs> that's, that's great. Jane? Hi, Jane. Hi, Jane. Great to see you. And you. Um, what this, I was... Jane, Jane has been doing this stuff with the program she runs for decades. So <laughs> I just want to say that. So if you want a model of somebody who's, who's teaching and writing, has been engaged with practice for the good, look at Jane. Thank you, Jean. That's very sweet. Um, I, I was I was pondering your um, it's a bit of a long winded question, but overall your presentation, you got to the online platforms, which imply this need to translate academic knowledge into practice. Um, but then there's also the relational dimension. Um, where the, there's the opportunity to co-create knowledge um, with practitioners as, as you're going through the process. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on this sort of temporal dimension of how, when, when you involve um, practitioners and for how long, um, if in order to make that difference of impact, because it's it's so complicated in, in business and management. You can see how technical subjects like, um, you know, somebody in climate change, in meteorology, or somebody in the technical sciences can make a difference with some knowledge that they translate into practice. But the process of co-creating and learning involves relationships over a longer period of time and um, where the evidence based management may, might be brought in, in in different stages. So I, I think that was part of your paper um, with Sarah Rines, but it hasn't been strongly part of this presentation. So that temporal dimension, I think it's is something it would be interesting to talk about. Yeah, I, I, you're right. The, um, 
And when I started doing collaborative research, it was before people were talking about impact. Uh, I mean, I impact is a comparatively recent topic, uh, I think affected in, in large part by the UK government of making it salient. So when I, so, so when I started doing collaborative research, I wasn't trying to um, have an impact on practice other than the folks who I was doing the, the research with or the settings I was in, or sometimes when I've done it. And um, so sometimes when I'd be interviewing somebody who was not one of the leaders, they would have a chance to tell me what they really want their leaders to learn, <laughs> but the, they didn't want to tell them themselves. So that was a very different topic. I think the, I think the notion of, the, actually what you're raising is, you know, who are you having the impact on? If the impact is on somebody other than anybody you've ever heard of, then that, and it might be relatively immediate, then one of the things you probably want to do is get, is publish in a very highly reputable journal and make sure that somebody in one of these online platforms knows what you've published. I think that's one of the things, if you're focused just on impact, that's probably what you want to do. And it may not matter at all where your knowledge came from. Okay. I, I guess I think that's that's a really important point is that the temporal boundaries have changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're focusing on impact. And, and there's also a difference between impact, I mean, one of the complications and all this stuff is impact is with some of the online platforms, impact is measured by how many clicks are there. So nobody knows if anybody's doing anything differently. Nobody knows if anybody's thinking differently. Nobody knows if anybody is motivated differently. All they know is that a lot of people clicked on it. So it's hard. It, so any kind of assessment is is beyond uh, clicks is is challenging in itself. I mean this this all this all all raises um, very complex questions of what does it mean for somebody to change in some way as a result of our research. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Um, Chatwick, would you like to go next? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm entering my third year uh, of PhD. I'm very thankful for this session. Uh, I came to academia from industry, and I'm just wondering um, how much do we need to involve and engage with practice, knowing that we have these insights from our previous professional life? Would you have any thoughts on that? Um, I know that there are some schools that say, that was then, this is now. Uh, I don't know if you're at a university that says that was that and this is now. I, I think that many people enter this field because of work experiences they've had that have raised questions for them that are really consequential. I, I know that a major reason I entered this field was that I had been a high school teacher and we had had some organization development practitioners come out to work with our school and it had been a complete catastrophe. And it made all of us decide all this stuff about participation, it, it, this, is, this is ludicrous. I'm not doing it again. And, it, and, it, and it, the effect that it had on me was to get me to think, Wow, this stuff is really powerful, but it can be powerful for the bad. How can I have? How can I work with this in a way that is that is more competent than what these folks did? And so, I what I would say, I personally would say, is that your prior experience, the people you've worked with, matter a lot. 
and there may be ways that you can collaborate in some way with the folks at your primary, prior, your, your work experience to, to study some of the things that really matter to you. So I don't, I don't know if that's enough of an answer, if you want to say more about that. Well, this is definitely helpful. I was uh, more wondering where, where do we stop? Like when do we actually know that we do have some insights from practice that we can translate to academia and vice versa? Um, does that make sense? What yeah, that? although that, that, that's complicated. I think if you write an absolutely best-selling book on like In Search of Excellence, that probably academics will read it, <laughs> but uh, that, I mean it's 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 a challenge. Under, I I think that I think a, a lot of impact is likely to be local. If you know some people and they they affect your thinking and then you're able to spread it, then that matters. Uh, I think that's easier, but uh, yeah. But I think that's easier. Thank you. But that's a good question. Also, I'm aware that in some countries, I don't know where you're in graduate school, but some countries consciously have university corporation collaborations. So if that's the case, then it might be helpful for you. But yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, Gina. Uh, one of the questions I have is, um, I mean, you, you highlight this, for example, some of the people who, for, such as Jay McKenzie, you know, who sort of at the forefront of this, doing the, this kind of work. Um, do you have any other suggestions in terms of maybe other scholars who inspired you or you see as exemplars of um, doing impactful work through their research uh, or throughout other ways of engaging um, with the practice, so to speak? And what might be perhaps good practices that, that those people are doing? Um, well, uh, there are many, and and certainly would know some too. I mentioned Andy Hoffman's book, The Engaged Scholar. He's clearly doing. It. Jerry Davis is a is an associate dean for impact or an associate dean for engagement or something like that at Michigan. His his job is to move beyond research and have people connect with the bigger world. Um, Andy Vandeven's work, he is re retired now, but a lot of his work was definitely, he would send doctoral students early on into particular organizations to see what was happening. Ed, Ed Schein is a, is, is a huge model for me. He's, I mean, to have somebody in his 90s still so concerned about the universe uh, wanting to make a difference in it. Um, and I, I had some conversation with him about, you know, well, you, I, you, well you're not going out and, um, you know, protesting stuff. And he's, he's very clear that he sees his primary impact, impact, that's not the word. He sees his primary work as writing. That's how he makes a contribution. That um, and he, he has mentioned he is the world's most reluctant volunteer, so he he doesn't get involved in protests and things like that. He tries to make a difference by writing, and by writing, he that means part informed by his working with practitioners, you know, and see what they actually do and that and how that makes a difference. So I guess I have a number of models, there are probably more, and those are, these are folks in the, in the US mostly. But um, I mean, I see Denise Rousseau starting working with <coughs> people in the UK as well as in the Netherlands, like Rob Reiner, David Denier, for example, to, to try to figure out how can we how can we help make knowledge helpful for managers? And what has to be learned about that? Stuff like that. So I think, um, I, I think that um, 
I, I guess those are just a few examples because I ended up mentioning several along the way, but um, I, I've ended up uh, I've ended up being inspired by a lot of people. I did notice there are a few more questions in the uh, in the chat, but I don't know if people want to raise them or not. Oh, Tima Bansal, yes, right, Tima. Uh, yeah, Tima, Jeff, there, uh, there are many others. Garima Sharma, who works a lot with Tima, grew up in India. And it, basically, she learned from growing up in India and seeing conditions there that she wanted to do work that mattered in the world. That was, you know, her, her family was not that poor, but she could, she could see poverty right next to her. So I guess a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of people who have it, who see their work as potentially a value beyond the local setting. It can be good, but there are many ways of doing it too. I don't, I don't want to get too carried away with this. I, I can, but others of you know this too. Thank you, Jin. Um, do we have any other more questions or comments, insights that anyone would like to share? Is there anything on the chat that's worth exploring? I don't know about that. I... Yeah. Rishka? Hi there. Um, so maybe um, maybe you can point me in the right direction or help frame 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 my 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 thoughts and, and I welcome from the chat too. Um, in impact, um, uh, attractive word, buzzword has a lot of energy around it. Um, but my my direction is definitely uh, impact in business and management that relates that would relate to SDGs, something like that. And, and sometimes the conversation around yeah, SDGs, you're talking about the UN development goals. Is that what you're OK, exactly. So just, you know, environment or yeah. um, you know, uh, social justice. Um, and some, sometimes when I hear the, um, the conversation around impact, depending on who's holding it or, or you know, who the author is, it's um, it, it might it might relate to management and big business, you know, and and that that's important obviously for national economies, but it's it's very different than the conversation that I want to join. So um, uh, I I know this is a little bit of an un, unformed thought, but I'm I'm figuring things out and finding um, the right conversations to have, and I just sometimes I feel that the term impact, it feels a little bit uh, appropriated or used in, in multiple different ways. Yeah, and I don't even know that you need to use the word impact. Let, let me just say that. It, I'm not just talking about impact here. I'm just, that is, the, a cur, that is a current term that is very influential that I think is due to the UK government. But I don't think that's the only way of thinking about it. Most of the collaborative research I mean, it was not related to impact. Uh, for me, a lot of the issue is relational, personally. But I will also say that what does, here, here's one of the things I would say, um, what do social sciences, scientists in particular, have to contribute to issues of global concern? It We're not going to, be able to measure the amount of lead in water, or we're not going to measure, you know, who's, who. do we have to stand six feet away from five or four feet away from saying, I think a lot of what we have to contribute um, is, is what we know about human beings getting along with each other. And if we can do research that addresses in some way how do human beings relate to each other? Even if it's not directly about the SDGs, even if it's not directly about climate change, 
if we can do research that builds people's capacities to relate to each other, we're doing something very important. Okay, so I'm going to say that. I, I think that some of the work might seem a little separate, but anything we contribute that has to do with how human beings connect is really important uh, and valuable. Does that answer your question enough, Fran? That's, that's perfect, thank you. Thank you, Marish, and thank you, Jean. I think this is a good way to end our discussion, I think, Jean, what do you think? Yeah, this, yeah, this is a good ending point, yes. So. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today and raising your questions. And thank you, Jean, so much for, for your insights and sharing your experience with us. It was really interesting and helpful.